You know what some of the oldest beings in the realms are? I don't mean in an evolutionary sense or that they live for 200 or 500 years. No, these monsters have been around since before the gods themselves. That's before time, before any recorded history. As far as we know, they could have been around since the D&D equivalent of the Big Bang, as if they walked straight out of an episode of Doctor Who. So let's look at the Abolith. Abolith may not have been around for the creation of the Forgotten Realms universe, but they were the first to dominate it. With their psionic abilities, they enslaved other creatures by learning their deepest desires and then fulfilling them using those same psionic abilities, tricking the victim into servitude. They also had a failsafe for the stronger willed should they ever break this mind control. They're mucus. Avalis don't breathe in a conventional sense. They create an oily film that they coat their skin with, which allows them to then breathe water and air. This mucus is also the failsafe. As to any other creature, this mucus alters their physiology, making their skin translucent and only being able to breathe underwater. This kind of forces the enslaved creature to stay at least accessible to the Aboleth. And speaking of enslaved, Aboleths have an ability known as enslave, where three times per day they can attempt to magically charm a creature. Notice that full stop there? I didn't mention a period that the creature is charmed for because in most circumstances, there is none. The Abolith's enslavability is among the most powerful of its kind, as it does not permit a saving throw unless very specific in certain circumstances. Those circumstances being A, the affected creature takes damage, B, the Abolith dies or moves to another plane of existence, or C, the target creature is more than a mile away from the Abolith for more than 24 hours. That is ridiculous, and it's a real saver suck for any person in your party that gets enslaved. And by the way, if you are trying to outlast the Aboleth, well, as I mentioned, they do not die. At least not by natural means. They can, of course, be killed, but they live as long as they're permitted, and they do not stop growing. Their growth only just slows down. They can grow to be quite large. For instance, this depiction by Kira, who's... Well, this shows an Aboleth that's over 200 feet long. This would be considered a Grand Aboleth, which is a variant of the largest Aboleths there are. And a little note here, when Abolis are killed, their spirits return to the elemental plane of water, where a new body forms over the next few days or months. Speaking of variations, like my Mimic video, the Abolis listed in the Monster Manual is not the most powerful version of it. In fact, they are considered the weakest of their kind. They're just the most common, as their primary duty is to corral slaves and maintain them. So DMs, if you want to give your players a challenge, Start adding on some other abilities or search up greater, noble, ruler, or, as depicted, the very truly terrifying Grand Abolith. Now, moving on to the most iconic aspect of the Abolith, their memory. Aboliths have an eidetic memory, which means they remember everything they have ever seen, ever smelled, ever tasted, ever felt, and ever heard. They have a perfect memory, and not only their experiences, but as part of their lineage, they are given the knowledge of their parents and pass on their own experiences to their offspring. This does not mean that they are a hive mind, as they are not at all connected, they just share the knowledge of their ancestors. They do have their own personality, as even though their knowledge is directly passed down, they do have an individual experience beyond their birth, which shapes them as sentient beings. This memory is also what has given them their greatest grudge, the gods. So Abolus remember a time before people, before faith. So when one day a person started believing in something, a higher power, that higher power was thought, or called, into existence. The gods take their power from their followers' faith. So when the Abolists seen these beings just show up and have power over mortals, the Abolists were kind of pissed. A war then waged between the gods and the Abolists, with ultimately the Abolists losing out and retreating to other planes and hiding away in the Underdark. So like when you work your butt off to pay for college and get your degree, pay your own rent, scrimp and save to get by and then some rich boy has his parents pay his way while you're burnt out for four years and then you're forced to hide away from the world and lick your wounds while the rich boy is lauded and praised. Yeah, but like it happened like a life ago. Well, not if you have the perfect memory of that defeat stuck, locked in your DNA, clear as anything as if it happened an hour ago. That is the curse of a Diabolus. Their defeat is literally as fresh as it could ever be, as if it just happened. Even though it happened millennia ago to their ancestors. 
All right, let's talk a little bit about them here as they are large aberrations. They have a swim speed of 40 and a walk speed of 10 feet, so they are amphibious. And they have a big bad tail swing that's a very strong melee attack for a psionic creature. They've been described as eel-like creatures with three eyes, tube-like appendages, and many mouths, anywhere from one to seven, which lets them talk in that weird aboleth tongue. They consume the memories and experience of the creatures they eat, and they tend to live in watery environments normally surrounded by their enslaved servants. And one of the most common slave creatures found with aboleths are chules. Chule, which sounds like jewel. Chules are large crustaceans created by aboleths as their guardians, hoarders, and workers. Whenever a chule is near an aboleth, they slip it right into an obedience mode and follow the aboleth basically to any whim or will. Chules have an innate ability where they can sense magic items, and this normally leads them to be able to sneak up on unsuspecting adventurers. Aboleth's watery layers also have their own actions and effects on the lands and creatures within a radius of a mile of them. This can be anything from spoiling fresh water to creating illusions of itself, so you could definitely create a Cthulhu-like mad village praising and obeying the Aboleth. So, how do you play them? In your game? Well, you metagame. Literally use the knowledge you as a DM have as the creator and overseer of this world. Aboleths have been around that long, have that much shared knowledge, they know everything they've ever seen or heard or experienced that is not out of the question for these beings to know everything about your game and the world in which it takes place. In fact, possibly the only knowledge out there that eludes an Aboleth is divine in nature, as the gods would need to keep some information hidden away from possibly their greatest foe. AJ Pickett, and man I love his videos, he gives a perfect example of how advanced and knowledgeable an Aboleth could be. And beware, I am paraphrasing, but the entire paragraph where he talks about this is packed full of great information and hooks. Aboleths are smart enough to travel through time without affecting their future or reality. Think about that for a second. Think of everything and when it comes to time travel and every pop culture media you've ever seen. This is the riskiest thing. And Aboleths are smart enough not to be able to modify anything. That information was around the 27 minute mark, but if you want to check out the whole thing for yourself, I've put it in the card here. Now, I don't want to overstep here and tell you how to play your game, but the Abolus, to me, wouldn't be your random encounter, cave-dwelling creature. There would be minions, slaves, the lair effects for a mile around before the players have any sign of actually encountering the Abolus itself. This, coupled with their knowledge, is why I believe they are one of the best big bad evil guys for your campaigns. You want something mid to high level that wants to destroy a faith based town? Aboleth. Something that's destroying religious artifacts of great power? Aboleth. Something even plotting genocide to remove the faith base of a god? These are your big bads. That's an Aboleth. Maybe an Aboleth found some scroll or ramblings of a wizard driven insane believes that their great ascendant, Piscathesis, is returning across the ring of realities to their prime plane, and they wish to ready the world for their return. And the only way they think they can be worthy of them is to enslave or rid the world of anything not Aboleth. They have grand plans beyond mortal thinking, or even possibly comprehension. Now, before we finish up, here's a few fun tidbits, a few fun facts. Vokoto, the big bad of Rus Rumblecusp Island in Critical Role's second campaign, was believed by many initially to be an Aboleth, but is in fact a modified Morkoth from Volo's Guide to Monsters. The Mighty Nine, seen here encountering Vokoto, depicted by Jacob Grimoire. The link to Volo's and Jacob's work in the links below. The Aboleth entry is the first spelling error in the Monster Manual. See an Aboleth Lair entry. I wrote this entry, but have misplaced the note of which word it was, so if you find it, please comment it below. Aboleths have a class system much like our own society, and they, but they are only allowed to breed within those classes, otherwise for procreation they utilize their hermaphrodite physiology to impregnate themselves. And like my Mimic video, the Aboleth, as I've said, is not the most powerful version de depicted in the Monster Manual. They are in fact considered the weakest. In the book Lords of Madness, written for the third edition, it is said that Piscathesis is a representation of Cthulhu. So, if you're still watching, thank you. Please give this a like and a subscribe and check out this cool video I did on Rust Monsters. At least I think it's Rust Monsters. I'm not sure which order these are coming out. Anyway, yeah, thanks. Right, bye.